Hello, I'm Donald Lloyd-Jones, Chair of the Committee on Scientific Sessions Programming for the American Heart Association, and I'm here at Sessions 2019 with Dr. David Goff, who's the Director of the Cardiovascular Division at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. David, welcome. Thank you, Don. We're continuing a tradition we started last year when I interviewed David about some of the NHLBI-funded research that's being pre presented here at Sessions. So we're going to get to that in just a moment. But David, I wanted to start to have you talk a little bit about the document that you published in Circulation Research a little bit earlier this year, talking about how the, the cardiovascular division is going to implement the strategic plan for National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Well, thank you, Don. It's a pleasure to be here and to be talking with attendees for the Heart Association Scientific Sessions, one of my favorite meetings of the year. So yes, back in February, we published a paper that outlined some of our priorities for cardiovascular science over the next five to 10 years. Um, our strategic vision for heart, lung, and blood was a little generic because we cover heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorders. And so this document put a cardiovascular framing around the strategic vision. We identified six areas for new strategic priorities over the next few years. The first one is addressing uh, social determinants of cardiovascular health and health inequities. And that first word's really important, it's addressing, not describing, not studying, because we've done a lot of that. What we haven't done a lot of is supporting intervention studies to see what we can do about some of these important social determinants of cardiovascular health and health inequities. Secondly, we want to do more research on understanding resilience, the idea that some people, despite being in an adverse environment, do quite well. If we could learn more about that, we might be able to leverage it to help others. Third, we're interested in, in supporting more research on promoting cardiovascular health across the lifespan, how we can improve cardiovascular health from the womb to the tomb, as they say. Uh, we're really excited about that. And then there are three more disease-specific areas that we're focused on, hypertension, because it's the leading cause of death and disability on the planet. Uh, heart failure, especially heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, because we know so little about how to treat it. And finally, vascular contributions to cognitive impairment and dementia. This is an issue that becomes increasingly important as we age, that we uh, really want to keep our brains sharp. And we've learned that um, vascular risk factors contribute to cognitive decline, especially hypertension. Recently, we showed that treating hypertension more aggressively could help reduce the uh, progression of cognitive decline. And so that gives us hope that other cardiovascular interventions might also result in improved cognition across the lifespan. So we can all sprint to the finish line, if you will. Uh, that would, that's a wonderful thought. <laughs> Excellent. So let's turn a little bit now, David, to talking about uh, uh, some of the NHLBI-funded research that we're seeing here at Sessions this year. Um, you know, first one, and, and boy, it's hard to miss this one, it's really the buzz of the meetings, the ischemia trials. Um, two trials in patients with um, uh, documented ischemia, stable ischemic heart disease, um, with or without angina, but most of them had angina, um, and randomized then to optimal medical therapy, hopefully truly optimal medical therapy, versus an initial invasive strategy where uh, optimal revascularization would be applied, and then follow up for over four years. So how do you view the results of this trial? Well, first, we're really pleased to have been able to support such a trial. We're, we think that the results are really going to guide practice and care and outcomes of patients for years to come. So we're really pleased about that. As I see the results, they really underscore the importance of optimal medical therapy. The things that we know that work, intensive statin therapy, antiplatelet agents, antianginals, they were used very effectively at high levels in this population and they showed that that alone was a really good uh, foundation for secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. The other results from the study, which I find very interesting, is that the, uh, the revascularization approach can be very helpful for some patients to treat symptoms. Yeah. So if, despite optimal medical therapy, uh, with secondary prevention strategies and antianginals, uh, patients continue to be uh, compromised in their quality of life and their ability to function with angina, uh, then revascularization looks like a very important part of the therapy that, that we have to offer those patients. So it'll be and interesting in what, fact, how clinicians take up on this. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, in fact, you know, if, you, if you notice the, in the results in the optimal medical therapy group, 
a quarter to a third crossed over by four years to actually get an invasive procedure to, to, to document uh, whether there had been progression of their, their coronary disease. And, and so, you know, I think the top line results that there was no difference between the initial approach is really reassuring. And I think it does allow clinicians maybe to have more tailored discussions with their patients. You know, we can choose either of these. You're having more symptoms. Maybe the invasive approach would be more favorable. And in fact, there are quality of life uh, uh, outcomes data very nicely documented to show that. Or I think you're a bit lower risk. Uh, you're not having as many symptoms. We can try optimal medical therapy, and we may do just great. But if we need to cross over, we can. We're, we're not going to risk too much by waiting. Yeah, I think that's important. There was no safety problem with either approach, no safety signal. Uh, and I think what it does provide is some time for that discussion to occur, um, at least as I see the results, and I'll be interested to see how the guideline groups uh, interpret it. As I see the results, there's no need to rush into a procedure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's time to try the optimal medical therapy approach, including using antianginals, and see how people do recognizing that if they continue to have anginal symptoms that aren't easily controlled, there's a very effective therapy that can be offered. We've got a safety net or backup plan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interestingly, parallel study, same design, but applied in CKD patients, and in fact, half of them with ESRD. Um, and what did you find about those results that was compelling? Well, what I, what I found most compelling was that the results were very similar yeah. between the two groups. And I think that internal consistency uh, provides even more um, confidence that, yeah. that these results are, are likely true. Yeah, and, and I think not surprisingly, the event rates overall were much higher in this oh, CKD yes. group. Um, and, and there's that temptation to be more aggressive, but we don't necessarily have to be. That's right, of course the event rates were higher, but the, the interesting thing is that the, the two different interventions were reasonably comparable yeah. in terms of their effects on the primary outcome. Terrific. So let's switch now to talk about a different topic. It's getting a lot of buzz at sessions. The Colcott trial, uh, trial of colchicine given to patients with recent MI within 30 days. Uh, and they showed a significant reduction in a composite endpoint of follow-up uh, over a reasonably short period of time. Um, and uh, this was not an industry-funded study. You guys didn't, uh, didn't fund it either. But, boy, it sure brings back to mind the, the CERT results um, uh, with methotrexate and the the, um, the Cantos results with Um So inflammation continues to be a story here. Um, as you know, methotrexate uh, did, not, uh, uh, did not significantly reduce outcomes. Kenikinumab did, but it's not being pursued as therapy. Now we have this widely available ge generic drug, colchicine, and that is reducing uh, events. So what do we take from all this? Well, I think this is another one where it'll be really interesting to see how the guideline writing groups uh, yeah. interpret these data. Uh, I think this is very interesting. We have a long history at NHLBI of supporting research on inflammation as a part of the atherosclerotic process. And we've, we've known for many years, decades, that uh, inflammation is an important part of the process. What we haven't known is whether intervening could do something to improve outcomes. Uh, and as you mentioned, you know, the Cantos trial with Kanakinumab uh, showed some promise. And then the study that we funded with methotrexate, CERT, showed no effect on the um, atherosclerotic outcomes. And so there was a lot of uncertainty in the community. I think this trial provides additional reason to be hopeful that um, better interventions in the future for the inflammatory processes might be even more effective. You know, I think this outcome uh, is promising. And when I looked at under the hood and looked at the details, um, you know, most of the effects seem to be on hospitalized angina with, with urgent revascularization, a, a softer outcome than, say, the myocardial infarction and cardiovascular death and strokes. Um, so I think that deserves some careful thought in terms of, of how this uh, intervention might work. Now the results were in the same general direction for the different parts of the composite outcome. Uh, you know, this is a relatively short-term trial, so we have less information about maybe long-term safety and efficacy than we might want. But it's a treatment that we know a lot about mm -hmm. that's widely available. And was very well tolerated. Very well tolerated. Yeah. The, o the only kind of adverse event signal that I saw, which was tiny but statistically significant, was a little bit more pneumonia in the colchicine group. So, you know, we need to be maybe a little more targeted in our, in our uh, management of the uh, immune system and inflammation cascade. 
Yeah, and I think the pneumonia signal is a very interesting one. I saw that too, and I wondered whether there was um, attention to uh, provision the pneumonia vaccine in this population. Hmm. Yeah. Because that's something that we recommend for people with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which all these patients had. And it would really be interesting if we could go back and see, did people have, were they up to date on their pneumovax? And if not, you know, is, is that something that we would really need to make sure we were using uh, if we were going to use this therapy, this colchicine? Uh, very interesting results. Yeah, yeah. So let's talk about a population we almost never get to talk about when we're, when we're saying the words clinical trial, and that's people with congenital heart disease. Um, another trial being presented here that you guys funded at NHLBI, the FUEL trial. These are patients who've undergone a Fontan procedure, adolescents who've undergone a Fontan procedure uh, to fix their congenital heart disease. Um, obviously, the long-term problems there with pulmonary hypertension, and so this used a drug Udenafil, cousin to Sildenafil, to see if it could improve exercise outcomes uh, in these patients, and 400 patients. I mean, this is huge for this field. So tell us what you found there. Uh, yeah, we're really excited about this uh, trial and, and the results. So the Fontan procedure, for people who aren't familiar with it, is a procedure for children who are born with a single ventricle. Uh, and so the, the surgery that's done is, is done to have that ventricle, whether it's a left ventricle or a right ventricle, uh, supply the body. And so there's no ventricle pumping blood to the lungs. And so there's passive perfusion of the lungs uh, that's aided by inspiration, expiration. Uh, and so um, these children, as they get older, they develop pulmonary hypertension, which really limits their exercise capacity and their quality of life. And so and, they're- And their survival. And their survival. Yeah. Many of them end up either with a transplantation or, or dying waiting for a transplant, which is just terrible. So, so this therapy, we, the hope was that it would improve um, exercise capacity and quality of life and uh, possibly at some point we might even learn about uh, longevity by reducing the pulmonary hypertension. Uh, and uh, the results of the trial are really encouraging. Uh, you know, uh, people who are familiar with trials know that there's always a primary outcome and then there are secondary outcomes. And in this case, the primary outcome was the maximum oxygen consumption, so what's called VO2 max. So that's at the point of exhaustion. And although there was a really big difference between the groups in the VO2 max oxygen consumption at the point of exhaustion, the statistical test was borderline. The p-value was 0.06, and so no cigar, but close. Mm -hmm. uh, what was interesting in terms of secondary outcomes is that an outcome that might even be more important in your everyday life is your oxygen capacity at the uh, aerobic threshold. So like what you can sustain this is the kind of level of physical activity that you can sustain for a long period of time, not the level that has you exhausted that you have to quit. And, and there the difference was large and statistically significant, at least at the nominal p-value of 0.05. Of course, that's a secondary outcome. Mm -hmm. But it's very promising that this drug, which we know works to reduce uh, pulmonary hypertension, uh, looks like it's really gonna be helpful for these kids and uh, adolescents who have undergone a Fontan procedure because right now there's really no good therapy for these kids. And so this is very promising and we're very pleased to have been able to support it. Yeah, it's good to see NHLBI supporting this, this kind of research in this growing population now, four million people in the United States with congenital heart disease. Uh, so we're gonna see more of these trials, I suspect. Uh, we hope so. Yeah, so David, I wanna thank you so much for spending time with us today and talking about some of the things that NHLBI is interested in the future, the areas of focus for implementing the um, NHLBI's plan, and then some of the recently funded uh, NHLBI research, which uh, I think is pointing the way towards the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Don. It's always a pleasure to be here.